Alrighty, alrighty. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, if you want to start turning there, uh, we'll read from there in just a few minutes. Man, we've had such a great week. And uh, just once again, want to say thank you to everybody that participated and came and fellowshiped with us and was a part of this with us. And for those who prayed and maybe couldn't be here, but you prayed for Vacation Bible School, we want to thank you so much. And it's just it's such an important part of, uh, of, our, of our church life here and culture that we've, uh, that we've cultivated here. And, you know, the thing about it is, is we can think back about from uh, when we were kids and no, no vaca- uh, vacation Bible schools as we grew up and think about the people in those vacation Bible schools that had an impact on us. And that reminds me of other things in the Christian life that have an impact on me, that had an impact on me as I grew up. You know, I, I grew up in church and, you know, I was thinking about, about what I remember most about church and, and what I have the fondest memories of in church. And I think that one of the fondest memories I have growing up in church was the fellowship hall. Man, I can just remember back. I can picture our little tiny fellowship hall. You think your fellowship hall is tiny. Our fellowship hall was so tiny, but I remember thinking back uh, at, uh, in, in all the different things we had go on in that fellowship hall. The potlucks. Man, Baptists love potlucks. The fried chicken and the chicken dumplings and the cornbread and the peas and the casseroles. Just an endless sea of casseroles. You know, I remember... I remember my first youth activity. My first youth activity was in the fellowship hall at our church. Now, you know, I wasn't old enough back then to technically be a teenager, but I was as tall as a teenager. And so they invited me to come to the fellowship hall. And, you know, I went and had my first youth activity in there. You know, these kids today, they're spoiled. I mean, they've got their laser tag, and they've got their bowling, and they've got other things like that. You know what we did on my first youth activity? We went in the fellowship hall, and we watched the Three Stooges. Mary, uh, uh, Larry, I got dyslexia, uh, Larry, Moe, and Curly, and uh, we watched it. You know what? We liked it, too. We enjoyed every second of uh, of that. Well, it, it seems that I grew up in the fellowship hall. Then one day we built the gym. Oh, I'm sorry. We built the Family Life Center. And uh, we moved over to the Family Life Center. But man, I still have fond memories of that little fellowship hall at Tabernacle Baptist Church in Magnolia, Mississippi. If you grew up in the South, you and went to church, you spent time in the fellowship hall. I mean, youth activities and receptions, baby showers, vacation Bible schools, Sunday school classes, three different kinds of mac and cheese. You spent time in the fellowship hall, the cookies that everybody loves. And, you know, we, we, we have fond memories of the fellowship hall. Well, what I want to tell you this morning, and the subject of true Christian fellowship, I want to let you know that true Christian fellowship is not limited to the fellowship hall of the church. True Christian fellowship extends beyond the fellowship hall. It extends beyond potlucks and receptions. Fellowship is vital for Christian vital for a Christian. You cannot thrive as a Christian without Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship is what brings you from a church goer to a church member. It's the difference between going to church and being the church. We're exploring what it means to be a balanced Christian and you know as long as I have both feet on the ground I'm pretty stable, but the very second that I think I'm 16 and I prop up on one foot, I'm going to lose my balance 
Because I don't have both feet firmly planted on the ground, I'm going to stumble and I'm going to lose my balance and I'm going to fall. What we're doing in this series is we're going through some tent poles in the Christian life. You set up a tent, and as long as every pole is in its place and where it's supposed to be, it's highly unlikely that your tent will fall or get blown away. But those tent poles have to be in the right spot. Some tent poles that we've already discussed so far, we've discussed the tent pole of evangelism. If you want to be a balanced Christian, you have to be an evangelist. You have to be someone who spreads the gospel, who looks for opportunities to bring the message of Jesus to others, to take contacts and not just make contact with people, but take that from contact to challenge. We have to challenge people spiritually. And man, and then we talked about discipleship. We talked about investing in people. Man, we got to find someone. We got to be somebody's Paul to their Timothy. We got to find someone in the church that we can invest in, that we can have a Bible study with, that we can have a prayer group with, that we can talk about the word of God, that we can talk about spiritual matters. We need the older men and the older women to share with the younger men and share with the younger uh, women their experience in the church and how they can grow as a disciple, as a disciplined one of Jesus Christ. Now today we're going to talk about fellowship. Now there's a trend going on in Christianity today and it's mainly among pastors. And it's something that I've noticed as I've kind of, you know, kept my finger on the pulse of, of the trends of pastors these days. And there's a trend to go back to the orthodox ways. What that means is to go back to the early church, study the early church and see what they did. Now listen, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with studying church history. I don't have a problem with studying the early church fathers. What you have to realize is once you get into the late second century, into the third century and beyond, those churches can be studied but not modeled. I mean by the third century they were baptizing babies. By the third century, you had Constantine come in with the Roman Catholic Church. So the only churches that should be modeled are the churches found in this book. Are the churches found in the first century recorded in the pages of Scripture. What a church is and what a church shouldn't be is recorded in this book. It is we have sufficient information. We have the sufficiency of Scripture. Everything you need to know about a church is contained in the pages of the Word of God. So the only churches that we should emulate the good things they did and stay away from the bad, from the mistakes they made are recorded in the Bible. What better church to look at than the very first church that was that, that was ever created? The first church that was ever around, and that was the first church of Jerusalem. The church actually started in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, on the day of Pentecost. Christ had had resurrected, and he had been with his apostles for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he went away because the comforter could not come until he went away. And he said, I will send you someone. I'm going to send you a comforter. He's going to come in my place. And so uh, Jesus left, and 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, 120 people in a room. Man, the Holy Spirit came among them. And the Bible says it, it looked like, uh, like, like cloven tongues of fire laid on them. And they began to speak. And they spilled out of that little room in, into the street. And man, they began to preach. They began to speak in tongues. Uh-oh, it's a Baptist church. They began to speak in tongues, and what was happening is they were speaking in their own language, and somebody from a foreign language was understanding their speech. They weren't speaking gibberish. They weren't speaking an angelic language. 
They were speaking other foreign languages that are known that, that people can't interpret. And so they're there and, and, and they're preaching and people are hearing them in their own native tongue and they're getting the gospel and, and Peter gets up and man, Peter, Peter preaches the message and he preaches the gospel and people get saved. And then this is the beginning of the church. Man, if there's any church in history that we need to emulate the good that they did and we need to stay away from the mistakes that they made, it is this first church. This is the prototype church. With that in mind, we're going to go to Acts chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 41 through 47. The Bible says, So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I want to talk about Christian fellowship this morning. I want to look at this passage of scripture this morning, and I want to ask four questions. And the answer to these four questions are going to show us what true Christian fellowship is and what true Christian fellowship means. So with that in mind, let's ask the first question. What does fellowship mean? What does fellowship mean? Is fellowship an activity? Oh, Adrian Rogers used to always say that, oh, people think fellowship is eating donuts and drinking coffee. Is that fellowship? Is fellowship limited to the family life center? Is Fellowship limited to the fellowship hall of the church. Well, in verse 42, we see fellowship, and that's a Greek word. And of course, it's a Greek word that if you've went to church for any length of time, you've heard this word before. I've even preached on this word since I've been here at this church. And it's the word koinonia. Koinonia in its noun form is found 20 times in the New Testament. Now, it's translated as fellowship, but it's not always translated as fellowship. Sometimes this word is translated as communion. Sometimes it's translated as contribution. Other places, it's sharing. In other places, it's partnership. So my simple definition of fellowship has always been life sharing. But you could, if you put all these words together... You could say that fellowship or koinonia is sharing the life of Christ. It's sharing the life of Jesus. So it's, fellowship isn't just a social gathering. Fellowship is a spiritual gathering. Anytime you gather for spiritual reasons, you are in fellowship. So it's more than coffee and donuts. Fellowship is being social over spiritual matters. In fact, if you ask me, I think every word in verse 42 is fellowship. First, we see teaching. Now, um, some versions say doctrine. We have teaching. We have doctrine. So they were in fellowship when they gathered to hear the apostles preached. So they gathered together and they shared in doctrine. So what happened is, is they gathered together and they spiritually ate a meal together. That's what we're doing this morning. We are spiritually 
eating a meal together this morning. We are feasting on the word of God today. I remember when I was a kid, we would get our food and man, we would split and go to different rooms of the house. My dad would stay in the kitchen close to the fridge so he could grab a cold one. My mom would go into the living room and eat and watch TV. My sister would go into her room and eat and watch TV. I would go into my room and, 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 and watch TV. And man, that's just how we did it. That's, that's all I knew. And so then, but every once in a while, my mom would say, hey, you know what? Let's, let's sit around the kitchen table tonight. It was rare. It was rare that that happened. Then every once in a while, my mom would say, you know what? Let's just eat. Let's just eat in the same room, whether it's in the living room or at, at the dining room table, just all together. And then me and my sister, we would gripe and complain and we would fuss because we didn't want to do it. I wanted to go in my room so I could watch my Quantum Leap show. And I didn't want to go in there and eat with the family, but she would make me do it. And I remember that even though we'd always gripe and complain about coming together, it was so good when we did. Then we had such good conversation and we ended up having so much fun around the dinner table together. Unfortunately, that family unit didn't last. That family broke up when I was nine. Oh, how I wish we would have done more of that. Oh, how I wish we would have done more of that sitting around together being together as a family instead of people breaking up and going off and doing their own thing. When we gather here as a church family, when we gather here on Sunday mornings, what we're doing is we're gathering around the dinner table. We're one big family. You heard the song. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a reason why I call you brother and why I call you sister, because this is a family. And we gather around on Sunday mornings. We're coming to the dinner table. We're here to eat a spiritual meal. We are here to feast on the word. And yes, you could listen to it at home on a, com on a computer. But man, you would miss out on that togetherness. You would miss out on that withness. You see, that withness increases your witness see that togetherness and that community you miss out on that when you're not present it's not the same then the bible says bread so the one thing they did is they shared in the ordinances of the church they partook in the lord's supper together but also they would share regular meals together they would have Something called a, an agape feast, a love feast, where they would eat together. That's all I've got on that point. We're Baptists. We got that. Continuing on. They prayed together. Man, they found opportunities to pray together. Growing up on Sunday nights. Before Sunday night service, we would have men's prayer meeting and we'd have ladies prayer meeting. And we each had our room. And the men would go into the, the men's prayer room. The women would go into the women's prayer room. And we would pray every Sunday night before service. That's how I learned to pray. I learned to pray as a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old boy going into that Sunday night prayer, that Sunday night prayer, men's prayer meeting and listening to those men pray in that room. And not everybody prayed. If you didn't want to pray, you'd tap the person next to you and you'd get skipped and the next person would pray. But that's where I learned to pray as a kid was listening to other men in the church pray. One day my pastor, he got an idea. He said, you know what? Let's all tonight, let's all pray out loud at the same time. Let's just try it. And man, we tried it. And man, that first night, man, we thought it was pretty cool. Man, we liked it. We said, man, let's just keep doing this. So for the next month, that's what we did. We all prayed out loud together at the same time. It was glorious chaos. 
And then we had a visitor come. And we all started praying out loud at the same time. And his eyes got that big. And two things never happened again. One, that man never came back to our church again. And two, we never prayed out loud again. We went back to the old format of one at a time. And you know, while I'm writing this section of this sermon, man, I was convicted. Because, man, I think we need to seek more opportunities to pray together. I think as a church, we don't pray together enough. And I'm, I'm committing right now going forward to organize more times of prayer for us. Because prayer is vital for a church. It's part of our fellowship. We have to be a praying people. You know, I feel verse 44 is a description of these fellowshipping Christians. It says, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. I think that's a description of these fellowship of Christians. They were together. They had one thing in common. You could say when we fellowship, we gather with a goal. When we fellowship, we gather with a goal. Did you know that there's a phrase in the Bible that appears over 60 times? And it's the phrase, one another. Romans 13, love one another. Romans 14, edify one another. Romans 15, admonish one another. Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, forgiving one another. We are commanded to love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, greet one another, serve one another, teach one another, accept one another, honor one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, sing to one another, submit to one another, be devoted to one another. And let me tell you something, you can't do one another on a computer. You can't do one another on a phone. You can't do one another watching TVN. You can't do one another that way. This is the only way you can do one another. Fellowship is sharing the life of Jesus with one another. Man, if there's any phrase that describes the, ch the church in this book, it's that phrase, one another. We need one another. That fellowship is one another. So that brings me to the second question. Why? Why is fellowship needed? Why is fellowship needed? So what we're going to do is we're going to go back in time. Okay? And we're going to go back in time and we're going to see why the first church needed that fellowship. And then we're going to come forward in time to us and... See the reason why we need fellowship. So we can begin to see why the early church needed this fellowship if we go back to verse 12. If we go back to Acts 2 and verse number 12 and verse 12 and 13, we see why, we, why they needed the fellowship. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. So this is the first glimmer of something called persecution. See, this is the first little glimmer of it. You see, they're, they're being mocked, they're being made fun of, and, you know, Jesus promised that persecution would come. And it actually started on the first day of the church. I mean, it started right out the gate. Jesus promised it would happen, and it's happening. And let me tell you something. For the church of Jerusalem, it's only going to get worse from here. It's not going to get better. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, the apostles were arrested, harassed, and beaten. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 5, they were thrown in jail. In Acts 7... Stephen, a deacon, was martyred. And in Acts 8, the persecution became so severe that the church actually scattered. And do you know what their response to this persecution was? 
Do you know what their antidote for this persecution was? It was fellowship. Their antidote for this persecution was fellowship. It's, it's, this, it's this coming together with this new family that God had created. In Acts 5, when Peter got out of jail, what did he do? He went to the church and he started preaching. In Acts 12, Peter gets out of jail again. And what does he do? He goes to Mary's house, John Mark's mom's house, to be with the church because the church had gathered to pray for him. So he went to that prayer meeting. Man, when this first church, when the world is persecuting them and the world's trying to clobber them, their fellowship was a refuge. Their fellowship was a place where they found strength. Psalm 29 11, the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Psalm 68 35, oh God, you are awesome from your sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and power to the people. Blessed be God. There is peace among a gathering of God's people. And let me tell you something nothing has changed from then to now. We need each other. We need each other now more than ever. We live in a world that is hostile towards believers. Everything in our culture fights against Christian fellowship. Everything in our culture. They don't want us to be together. They want to pull us apart. What's going on in this building this morning scares that world to death. Why? Because they're scared of losing control. Me and you, our goal is to surrender our lives to God, to surrender our lives to Jesus. And that scares the world to death because they lust after control. They want to control their own lives. They want to control their own destiny. They want to control their own identity. They want control of everything themselves. And they want to control you too. They want to control what you watch. They want to control what you think. They want to control what your kids learn in school. They want to control what comes on your phone and your child's phone and the commercials that come on. Everything about that world wants to control you. But in this little piece of heaven we have, in this little piece of, of country we have, we seek to give control to the God of heaven. And that scares them. That's why they don't like us. It's all about control. We scare them to death. You know, it used to be separate in a church and state. Now it's separate the church from the state. They want to get rid of us completely. They want to expel us. They come to us and say, oh, you can do your Christianity. Just keep your Christianity to yourself. I'm sorry. Christianity is not a private, personal experience. Christianity is meant to be shared. The gospel is meant to be shared. But when we do that, we get pressure from a godless society. It's the reason why they were persecuted, and it's the reason why we're persecuted. It's the reason why they needed fellowship, and it's the reason why we need fellowship. Pressure from a godless society. You know, what amazes me is those little robots that will vacuum your house automatically. Those little Roombas. You know, those little eye robots that'll just go around in a circle and they'll vacuum your house. And when they're done, they'll come back to a little charging station. Do you know they got those for lawns, too? I mean, I would never buy one. But uh, uh, they got, but I still think they're cool. Where this little, this little robot goes out and he it mows your lawn, mows a section of your lawn, then it comes back and charges. And after it's charged up, it goes out and it mows another section and comes back and charges. And man, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, having to push a lawn, push a push mower, I would have loved to have one of those. But I just bought that zero turn. I'm, I'm gonna use it because I'm paying for it. 
And, you know, but man, those things, I think those things are really cool. But the thing is that it goes out, it does its job in the heat and the sun and the dirt in the world. And guess what it has to do? It has to come back to that charging station. And it's got to recharge. This church is your charging station. This church is where you're recharged. This church is where you get your, where you draw your strength from to go live another day in that godless world. This is where you draw your strength. This is where you recharge your spiritual batteries. Because if you have no spiritual batteries in that world, the devil will chew you up and spit you out. My stepbrother was the highest non-commissioned officer in the army. I think it's Sergeant Major. Sometimes he could go off and he would be able to tell my stepmother where he was going. But other times it had to be a secret. Sometimes my stepmom would go weeks and weeks and weeks without talking to Matt. Not knowing when she would get to talk to him again. Then every once in a while, just out of the blue, they let Matt call home. Maybe it was a phone call. Maybe it was a video message. But every once in a while, just out of the blue, they would let Matt phone home. Now, during these calls, when Matt was on these missions, he couldn't tell my stepmother any details. He couldn't tell her where he was, what he was doing, when he was coming home. If he was, she'd always ask him, are you in an office or are you out in the field? And he could never answer. But you know, I always think that the reason why they let Matt do that every once in a while is to just to remind him what he's fighting for. To remind him what he's out there overseas, what he's fighting for. These men and women that, that, that give their lives to commit their lives to fighting for our freedom. They need our honor and respect. But they, as they're out there fighting, they also need to know, be reminded of what they're fighting for. When you come to this church, not only are you to be recharged, but you're to know what you're fighting for. When you come to this church, you're reminded why you put up with everything that you put up with. Why you put up with the mocking. Why you put up with the persecution. Why you just, just don't give in and live your life the way you want to live it. And do what you want to do. Because it's about 80 kids at a vacation Bible school. It's about 50 volunteers. It's about the Sunday school class you're in this morning. It's about the people sitting beside you in the pew right now. It's about about your children and them growing up and getting married and being Christians and raising up children of their own who love God and love this Bible. You need to be reminded what you're fighting for. What reminds you of that is Christian fellowship. Question number three. How is fellowship done? How is fellowship done? Verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were uh, taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So first we see a two-fold structure here. First they had the big meeting, which is in Solomon's porch. I've seen Solomon's porch. It's just a little portico off from uh, the, the temple mount, just where you would go, was covered and this is where the church met for a long time. So first you have the big weekly meeting. And that's comparable to our Sunday morning service. Now second, they had the smaller meetings house to house. So one was formal and one was informal. The second meeting, you can call this a Sunday school class. You can call it a small group. You can call it a brotherhood, a WMU. But it was a smaller person-to-person -person meeting where there was back and forth. There was the big meeting where we learned the doctrine, and then there was the smaller meeting where we talked about the doctrine. I honestly believe that is the model. And you need both. 
You need that big, uh, big corporate meeting, and you need that small meeting where you talk about the ideas and you share them, and let's ask questions, and, and, and we need both of those. But when, it, when you talk about church participation and how this is supposed to be done, you know what the question I get a lot of times is? Well, not a question, but here's a statement that I get. I love Jesus, but I don't go to church. Man, there are too many hypocrites up there at that church. I don't know if you heard that. Too many hypocrites up there at that church. I don't like organized religion. Well, here's a few things that I'm going to say about that. Number one, if you don't want to be around hypocrites, don't go to Walmart. Walmart is full of hypocrites. Number two, organized religion was a man's idea. Organized religion was God's idea. That's why he laid it out in the Word of God. Now, I ask you a question this morning. Can you be a Christian and not go to church? I mean, I, I guess you could, but what would be the point? Wouldn't it look silly? If Michael said, I'm going to be on a football team. So he puts on a jersey and gets a ball and goes out to the football field by himself and starts throwing the ball up in the air and catching it. They're throwing the ball to himself. Man, that looked pretty silly, wouldn't it? But man, if, if you want to play football, you got to join a team. Man, get a jersey, throw that football out on, on the field, play against another team. That's when it's fun. I'm not going to pay money to go watch a dude throw football to himself. That is no fun. Let me ask you a question. Would you go to an hour-long recital of a single tuba player? I could find better ways to spend a Saturday evening than to go watch a single tuba player play for an hour. All of us, you take that tuba player and you put that tuba player in an orchestra. Well, now you've got something. Now you've got something worth listening to. Now you've got something that's happening. Question number four this morning. When does fellowship happen? First of all, let me say, if you don't want fellowship to happen, it won't happen. If you don't want it to happen, it won't happen ever. Even if you come to church. Some people just don't want to be close. Some people, there are some families in my past that I would just try to get them to plug in and they just wouldn't. Try everything I could to get them to plug into some activities and man, they just would not do it. Let me tell you something. If you ever want more of Jesus, he wants more of, he wants more of you. Now, if you look at this church, you see this church started with 12, it grew to 120, and then it jumped to 3,000 overnight. And then in verse 7, we see the Lord was adding to their number day by day. So this fellowshipping church was a growing church. And I think there's a correlation. I, think, I believe the Bible says if you want friends, you've got to be friendly. And a friendly church is going to attract people. A friendly, fellowshipping church is going to attract people. And the Bible says the Lord added to the church. So if you do church the right way, God will take care of the growth. When does fellowship happen? Well, verse 46 says, day by day. Don't worry. I'm not going to tell you you've got to come to church every day. Okay, I'm not going to say that. But it was more frequent than less frequent. We see, first of all, that on the first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together, breaking bread, 2 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of the week, each one of you is to put aside and save, as he may prosper, so that no collection be made when I come. See, the first day of the week is when Jesus rose from the dead, and it's when the church met together. But then we have Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, there's that phrase again, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this verse says to forsake not the assembly. And then it says all the more as you see the day approaching or the day drawing near. So what that means is church attendance is more important now than it was 2,000 years ago when the apostles started the 
church because we're that much closer to Jesus coming back. I will continue to preach that if you fail to participate in a local church, you fail to obey a direct command of Scripture. You fail. You are commanded to go to church. You are commanded to go to church. Verse 42 says that they were continually devoted. Another version reads they were steadfastly committed. We've got too many Christians today that don't have committed fellowship. They've got convenient fellowship. They come when it's convenient. The fellowship is convenient. Listen, when you wake up on Sunday morning, the kids don't have to ask if we're going to church or not. We already know the answer. You know, if the kids ask, hey, is it time to go to church? Are we going to church today? You say to them, does the sun rise? Because it's Sunday. And on Sunday, we go to church. Now listen. You got to go to work or you're on vacation. I'm not going to run you down. But you get what I'm saying. Don't forsake church. We are, to, we are to be continually, steadfastly devoted to this fellowship. Why? You need it. I need it. We need it. You need the preaching and the prayer and the praise. You need the faith the fellowship, and the fun. Every week you need to hear a preacher get up and say, Thus saith the Lord. You need to eat the bread and drink the wine that represents the body and blood of Christ. You need the old rugged cross, and you need when the roll is called up yonder. You need the casseroles, the coffee, the cake, and the conversation. You need to shake hands, chase babies, and shout amen. You need to sweat, cry, and sometimes bleed at this church. You need church and church needs you because me and you are weak and we need the strength we get here to survive that world. That's right. If you're cooking a charcoal grill and you take out one charcoal and you set it to the side, what's going to happen is eventually going to burn out and it's going to die. But you take that same charcoal and you keep that charcoal together. They're going to burn brighter and hotter together, together than they ever will apart. <coughs> their witness increases their witness. Now I think John Wesley said it best. He said, I want the whole Christ as my Savior. I want the whole Bible for my book. I want the whole church for my fellowship. I want the whole world as my mission field. I want it all. How committed are you to the fellowship today? You know, we know John 3.16, but do we know what 1 John 3.16 says? We know by this he laid down his life for us that we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. What did the early church do? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. I propose to you that we need that fellowship today. We need that participation. We're so pleased with the participation last week. What you did here at this church made a difference and an impact on eternity. Let me tell you something about this deal. What happens on this hill is more important than your job. What happens on this hill is the best thing for your kids. What happens on this hill right here is the best thing for your marriage. What happens on this hill right here is the best thing for your mental health. Out there is a cruel, painful world, and lost people have to travel it along. Christ gave us the gift of the church. You know why Christ gave us the church? Because he gave us a little piece of heaven. If you ever wonder what heaven's going to be like, it's going to be a lot like church. Church is a little piece of heaven on this world for us to share with one another. Don't just come 
the church. Be the church. Don't just watch. Witness. Don't just receive. Participate. Let's commit ourselves to Christian fellowship today. Tell God you want it all. You want all the doctrine. You want all the fellowship. You want all the prayer. You want it all. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In just a minute, we're going to stand for invitation. I'm going to ask you this morning, whether it's at your seat or at this altar, that you ask God to renew your love, your commitment to the local assembly. He gave us church for a reason. It's where we recharge. It's where we get our strength. It's where we're reminded what we're fighting for. It's where we retreat when the world pounds down on us so we can go back out and do it again. It's more than coffee and donuts. It's preaching. It's prayer. It's being together as a family. Let's renew our commitment to church today. I'm going to pray. And when I end up praying, we'll stay with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for today. I'm so thankful for church. Church has had such a positive impact on my life. And it has brought my life to a place I never thought it would ever be. I dare to even 